I'm Blaine Warner. This is February 24th, 2022. We're at the Ontario County Historical Society Museum in Canandaigua, New York. Uh, this is a, an oral history workshop sponsored by the Ontario County Historical Society and the Wood Library. And I'm interviewing Peter Blackwood. Welcome, Peter. Good morning. Thanks for coming on this snowy, bleak day. Uh, I thought we'd start just with a uh, little biographical information, your dates of uh, birth and where you were born, your parents, just say who they were and then I'll sure. ask further questions if that's okay. Uh, I was born in 1954 mm -hmm. in Syracuse, New York. Um, I, we lived in Syracuse, New York, right in the city until I was two years old. <clears throat> then we moved to a suburb of Syracuse called Baldwinsville, mm -hmm. although we were out in the country. So starting about when I was two, we lived in a little ranch house that was in a neighborhood off of Route 31, a couple miles east of Baldwinsville, that had 52 identical slab houses so to speak, kind of like a mini Levitt town. Right. Um, and I lived there till I was 16. And you, where did you go to school? High school. When, well, that By was Bal Baldwinsville. Right, right. Until I was 16, and then we abruptly moved over to Oneida Lake, which is part of the Central Square School District. So my last two years of high school, I was in Central Square. And what what uh, reason did you move? You'd have to ask my father. Okay. I wasn't happy with the move. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> well, in the middle of high school, right, it's like right. move to an area where you know. That's your worst nightmare. Nobody. Right. There's one positive side to that, though. I met my wife after I moved, so Very nice. at the new high school. <laughs> Silver linings. <laughs> I'll say. Can you tell us a, about, a bit about your parents? Yeah, my m mom uh, was born in 1920, and she was an early college grad at SUNY Albany in about 1941 with an education degree, and of all times to teach high school history, she started teaching high school history in 1942. Yeah, that's... Yeah. That's a lot to teach, thanks to World War II. Right. And uh, had to, of course, with New York State, when I was a young child, she got her master's at SUNY Oswego and then taught. She, she taught high school history and then abruptly and only for about two years and then abruptly was asked by the government to do science work at the GE company in Schenectady in the war effort. So she worked in a lab, and I actually have a picture of her from a newspaper working in the lab, holding a couple of instruments, which I also have at home. Wow. <laughs> um, so she did that and worked at GE Company during the war. Why do you think the government asked her to do that? Oh, it was the war effort where they were right. having people, because she was a very capable person with a bit of a science background. Okay, because um, you say she taught... History? Yes, yeah, she taught high school history for a couple of years, I think a couple of years, and then did the, that bit, the stint at GE Company. Yeah. I'm not sure how long that lasted. It's interesting. But I also assume that's where she met my father, mm -hmm. who was born in 1917 and did not have a college degree, but worked as somewhat as a metallurgist for GE Company. Mm -hmm. um, he was analyzing, he was a specialist at analyzing metal through a microscope and why it was breaking down and failing, basically. So, and he would use uh, photography through the microscope to assess the metal. I presume that's where my parents met, mm -hmm. which would have been Schenectady at the General Electric Company right. in the mid to late 40s, because they got married in 1948. So that's interesting. They were both avid photographers. 
Yes. And I have, both my parents are deceased, and I have boxes and boxes full of black and white prints and negatives. Have you developed the negatives? What I've done is, as a photographer myself, I've photographed them mm -hmm. with backlight, and then on a computer reverse the images. A few. Yeah. I mean, of the tens of thousands? No. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but I have a lot of very usable negatives from the 40s. Uh, ski trips and camping trips yeah. and all kinds of things like that. And you were born in, let's see, 54. 54. Yeah, I have an older okay. sister mm -hmm. that was born in 1948 and a brother that was born one year before me, okay. 53. And your father during the war was? Yeah, during the war, my father was not at the GE company because he was in the Army. Mm -hmm. He was in the, what was called the Army Air Corps. So was mine. Okay, as a photographer. And I actually have some of his pictures, not many, but yeah. uh, maybe 20 pictures that he had taken during the war. He was stationed in India and Burma. Wow. And his basic function, the way he described it to us, was flying over China. He wasn't a pilot. He was the, mm -hmm. the reconnaissance photographer on the plane. Out, outside the plane? or Well, shooting through the bottom of the plane, right, right. taking pictures of Japanese installations in China. And according to him, they got shot at a lot. Yeah. So they were actually flying over Tibet and over China and taking pictures. And he started off, I believe, in India, and then they ended up moving into Burma. And then after the war, you know, came back. Yeah. So he was actually in Burma? Both, India yeah. and Burma, yes. There are a lot of things happening in Burma oh, sure. at the time. Not good things. Right. Um, that's very interesting. Did he ever talk about any of that? Mm, not too much. No, he was one of those kind of tight-lipped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There like many of the generation yes. in World War II. It's kind of like this was something we did and right. that's left there. Compartmentalized it. Yes, and as a psychiatric nurse of many years myself, I, and I worked at the VA for some years, mm -hmm. and I can tell you that that is one tolerable way to deal with potential uh, post-traumatic stress, is to compartmentalize it and put it aside. Right which I think many veterans from World War II did. Mm -hmm. I guess the other way is to ex to examine it thoroughly and... Uh, well, try, yes, try to bring it out. Right. There was also, doing research on that, I discovered one major, major difference between World War II veterans, I know this is off track a little bit, mm -hmm. between World War II veterans and Vietnam veterans, the average age of the GI in World War II was 26. Mm -hmm. And the average age of the GI in Vietnam was 19. Right. And that's a huge difference mm -hmm. in developmental age. Right. You're not even fully developed mentally. Correct. 19, are you? Well, depends on the person, but well, yes. It's a different phase of life right. compared to a full adult at mm -hmm. 26. And that really had a difference on the impact on people, right. including my father. Yeah. Who, um, that's very interesting. When my father got in the Army, he would have been 25, I believe, or it's 26, right in that range. I'm trying to figure out what my father would have been, but I'll say that <laughs> when it's my turn. <laughs> um, uh, tell me about your college years and where you went and so forth. Um, at the end of high school, I went to SUNY Albany for one year, and my now wife of 49 years was a, a year ahead of me in school, and so she was in her sophomore year at SUNY Plattsburgh, which is 150 miles north of SUNY Albany, mm -hmm. uh, right up the north way, as it was called. <laughs> Uh, I spent a lot of time hitchhiking up and down. Back when people used to do that, I used to stand yeah. at the throughway entrance of Albany with a sign that said Plattsburgh right. and get picked up and yeah. brought up to Plattsburgh by people. 
going to Montreal or Plattsburgh or wherever. Um, and did that. I took the bus a lot and I did ride shares a lot with people because colleges then had a ride board. I don't know if they still do. Yeah. Where you could look on a bulletin yeah. board yeah. and there'd be all these posted I remember that. ways to get a ride somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was visiting her very routinely through my freshman year at SUNY Albany. And it was fun. I enjoyed it, but I decided towards the end of that year that we should get married, mm -hmm. and she agreed. So then I decided to transfer to Plattsburgh. So we got married in May at the end of my freshman year of college. I we lived in Albany for and worked summer jobs, mm -hmm. and then we moved up to Plattsburgh. I transferred up to that school, and I did not care for the school. Why not? For lack of a better way of putting it, uh, I tend to think of things statistically. The average incoming freshman at SUNY Albany had a high school average of 90 or higher, and the average incoming freshman, not including my wife, at SUNY Plattsburgh had a high school average of maybe 75 to 80. So in all the classes that I had, I felt like I had gone back to high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, it was very boring. I felt challenged at Albany and mm -hmm. not challenged and very bored at SUNY Albany. So after about a month of school, I just kind of stopped going. <laughs> wow. And what did your wife think of that? She said, uh, I think you need to find a job. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> this is very goes into the next thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, I remember wandering around Plattsburgh. We lived in her dad's house. Her father was a professor there. Okay. And he took a leave of absence uh, for a year because he was out of town, and we lived in his house. And wandering around Plattsburgh looking for a job, I wandered into the post office, and the men there were snickering at me. I had long hair then, and they're kind of like, you're not going to get a job at the post office unless you're a veteran. And they pointed across the street and said, just go talk to that man over there. And it was a recruitment office. This was 1973. Uh, the United States was done with Vietnam for the most part. We still had some personnel there, but we hadn't been sending people mm -hmm. there. And then I I assume that this guy was very good at his job because I knew nothing about the Army, had never thought about joining the Army, and he talked me into joining possibly the Army. So he was good at his job? I would say he was, <laughs> yes, <laughs> in retrospect. <laughs> right. And I went, I remember going back to the house and saying that to my wife, and at some point she said, Well, you can't just join the Army without me. So we went down as a couple and talked to him, and he talked us into joining the Army as a couple. They had a system back then. This was the beginning of the all-volunteer Army mm -hmm. of the 70s, and they had a system back then called the buddy system. And the buddy system, you got a written guarantee to be with your buddy for 18 months, and then they could do whatever they want. And so we joined on that premise, both with guarantees. They would guarantee you your job after a full day of taking tests. Mm -hmm. And we both had guarantees of being medics, which we knew nothing about, and stationed after training at uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which seems interesting because we didn't know anything about Oklahoma. Yeah. Um, and then you did? And we did, interestingly, after the full day of testing, which we took with, you know, 20 other guys in a room, uh, literally all day long, they sat down with us and said, well, we have found two different avenues that you guys could go in. One is being medics at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and the other is being photographers stationed at West Point. And the guy said, what that really means is you'll be in a studio taking pictures of cadets. And we kind of couldn't decide, and we literally flipped a coin. I remember wow. flipping the coin in the living room. <laughs> and I remember it because 
the quarter that I was flipping flipped way too high and went over the back of the television set. <laughs> and I had to crawl on my hands and knees and find it and read the results to Tina, my wife. You didn't turn it over well? No, no, looking. and we ended up at Fort Sill with, and becoming medics. That's, that was probably more interesting maybe than uh, taking photos of I had no idea. But it certainly led to other things. Yes. And I, so we were in basic training until from the end of October to Christmas of 73. And then we went together down to Fort Sam Houston, which is San Antonio, for medical training mm -hmm. for two full months. Lived in an apartment off base. And then after that, we went up to Fort Sill, Oklahoma for six weeks of in-hospital orientation mm -hmm. and training and worked in the hospital there. And th then what happened after that? Well, if you're a medic in the Army in a hospital like that, you're actually a nursing assistant mm -hmm. is what you do. I worked on a pediatrics floor and she worked on the newborn nursery. And if you remember, I said they gave you a guarantee to be together for 18 months. Right. And I suddenly, after, well, nearing the end of that 18 months, we even bought a house in Lawton, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. nice little ranch house. Um, I suddenly got orders for Germany, and I went to the commander, and I actually went over that man's head, tried to, mm -hmm. and asked if they could give my wife orders for Germany, too, and they wouldn't do it. They said, well, that's just not something we can do. It's kind of not selected here. So we had a child, and that got her out of the Army. Mm -hmm. And he was born in Germany in December of 1975, and we lived near Nuremberg for about a year. Do you get uh, dual citizenship if you have it? You can. But, you know, this was at the end of the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. and we had had that draft if you remember, right. yes, I do. that was not a great thing for a lot of people. And I, I had concerns, you could have had, we could have had dual citizenship for him. Mm -hmm. I had concerns of something like, well, what if 25 years from now, Germany suddenly has some weird change in government that mm -hmm. has control over our son and can draft him. So it seems simpler to just keep it as right. the one. I didn't think of that. Well, I was just looking at the unknown potentials right. of having a citizenship in a country, even if you're not living in it. Mm -hmm. So, no, we did just the one. And I worked as, a, Tina was not in the Army then in Germany, mm -hmm. and I worked as a medic for an artillery unit, which meant doing sick call every day, basically. Yeah. But Tina was with you. Oh, yes. Okay. Definitely. And did we you get government housing, or how does it work? Uh, no. Um, if you're a married couple there, the base, the, the base is in Germany. I don't know how they are now. In fact, I found out that the base we were on has closed since then and is now a big housing project full of condominiums. Mm -hmm. It was an old, it was a whole bunch of old structures, kind of like the Canandaigua BA, mm -hmm. and I think made years ago by Germans, obviously. and old stone buildings, but the whole base only housed about 1,200 GIs. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the bases in Germany were tiny little outfits like that, and they were spread all over the country. And it was explained to me that it was kind of done that way so that you could go into position if there was a sudden Soviet incursion or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, so the bases did not house married couples, unless you were an officer. <clears throat> so we lived off base in a little apartment that was in an attic. Um, really cheap rent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and only about a mile from the base. I used to ride my bike uh, 10 speed to, to work sometimes. And How long were you in Germany? About 13 months. No, 12 months actually. Okay. And you were in Nuremberg? Near Nuremberg. Right. We were a little base, a little town called, uh, it's probably not pronouncing it correctly, but Herzogenarik, mm -hmm. which was about, I'm guessing, 20 kilometers from Nuremberg. So Nuremberg's where they had the war trials. Yes. And was there any, did you visit any uh, 
oh. sites or? Well, not related to that, but Nuremberg was historically very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we used to go down, they had, a, it had an old walled part of the city from the medieval mm -hmm. times and you right. could walk through there. Um, there were other towns around there that were similar to that. Um, so it was, it was always interesting to go there. Did you pick up much of the language? No. <laughs> <laughs> I remember once, prior to Christmas, I wanted to, uh, not sure why, but I wanted to buy a hand puppet for my wife, uh, maybe related to the fact that we had a one-month-old then, mm -hmm. I don't know. But I remember standing in a store in our town trying to get across to, it was like a toy store, trying to get across that I wanted a hand puppet, and I had a huge amount of trouble doing that. Right, they didn't connect this with a puppet. It, no, I guess not. <laughs> Tina, had, uh, Tina had taken quite a bit of German in college, oh, so good. that was very helpful. Good. Yeah. So after Nuremberg? Or yeah, then we came house? back uh, in, I got, we got home in basically October of 76. Trying to figure what was happening around that time. So by, not by, much. By, by, by <laughs> home, you mean? Oh well, we we sat in Germany. We both got the GI Bill, which meant they would give us a monthly stipend, not pay for school, but give us a monthly amount of money right. to go to college. And I decided to target school, a SUNY school that had a nursing program mm -hmm. after working in hospitals. And Tina uh, was looking at excuse me, speech, speech pathology. So we sat in Germany in our little apartment with big books that we got on base that listed every college in the United States and every major yes, offered. I remember those books. Yeah, and we went through the all the SUNY schools mm -hmm. and chose Brockport and got home and lived at my parents' house for about three weeks in their basement in Brewerton, New York, mm -hmm. and then um, moved to Brockport and rented an apartment and started in the, uh, you know, after Christmas of 77. Full-time students, both of us. And we also took classes. We learned that if you took the right amount of classes in the summertime, you could keep the GI Bill coming around year-round. So we did that. Excellent. Yeah, I took some interesting classes in the summer, like tissue culture, mm -hmm. which is like microbiology but growing body cells. I took meteorology in the summer. We took a history of North American, native, native North Americans in the summer. Mm -hmm. I even took one class was wild edible plants. It was a four credit lab class. It was like a three week class and all we did was wander around in the woods every day. <laughs> Well, a teacher, you can eat this, you can eat that. It probably came in handy over the years. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, when did you come up to this area? Of the well, um, 19, Tina graduated in 1979 with an education degree with speech pathology. Mm -hmm. She did one year of work for BOCES uh, up around Hilton in you know, northern, uh, northwestern Monroe County. I can't remember the other county next to that. Right. Um, and I started 1980, I started working at Strong as a nurse. Mm -hmm. And about 1982, I believe, we moved to Livonia because Tina wanted to get her master's degree in both education and speech pathology, so she got in at Geneseo. Mm -hmm. So we rented a house in Livonia for a couple of years, and she got her, her master's, and then she got a temporary job filling in for a maternity leave here in Canandaigua mm -hmm. for a special ed. Okay. And after driving back and forth from Livonia to Canandaigua for almost a year, we decided to move here. Good and I was still working at Strong, mm -hmm. and we ended up in Rushville for 13 years. 
Where did you live in Rushville? We lived at 29 Gilbert Street, which is close to the middle of town, but it's the road. It's 245 down to uh, Middlesex. Mm -hmm. Um, when I and that we left there uh, 23 years ago, and I painted that house. We were there for 13 years. When I drive by that house, I see the paint job I did 35 years ago. Still, still there. on the house. <laughs> yeah. it's well done. Interesting. <laughs> um, and we ended up in Rushville because uh, the housing down there at that time, 1985, and it still is, I think, uh, was tended to be lower priced than the yeah. housing up here. Right. We didn't know anything about the area at all. And after a few years, it's like, oh yeah, we have a 10 mile long driveway to Canandaigua. <laughs> <So, like, laughs> and then, when did you move to Canandaigua? Uh, 98. Okay. We had a son in 93 and, uh, yeah, I have three kids. Uh, our youngest was born in 93 and his sister in 1998 Ian, our youngest one, was turning five, so was due to start kindergarten, mm -hmm. and his older sister was graduating that year from high school. Wow. Uh, as the valedictorian of her class, <laughs> um, and her name is Carrie, and <clears throat> that summer was a perfect time to move, because we wanted Ian to be in the Canandaigua schools. Right. Not that there's anything wrong with those schools, it's just it was much more convenient. Right, right. And she was graduating, so that's when we moved, was 98, to the house we're in now, right in Canandaigua. Speaking of Carrie, uh, your daughter, she's musical, but your family is musical, isn't it? <laughs> um, my... My wife isn't quite as musical as I am, I'll say. <clears throat> yeah, I grew up playing trumpet. And always play, excuse me one second. Sure. <clears throat> that time of day, well, you've been oral speaking. history, every day about 10 and 11 <laughs> o'clock I get this. <clears throat> it's been going on for years. <clears throat> um, I, yeah, and uh, my Two younger kids are very extremely musical. Mm -hmm. As you know, Carrie yes. plays trumpet. I used to play trumpet with her and when she was in high school a little bit, and then she'd play along to me playing guitar. Mm -hmm. And uh, we even did a talent show together where I played guitar and she sang Paper Moon. Did you win? Actually, we did. Uh, she sang Paper Moon and then played a little trumpet solo in the middle of the song that we made up, that she made up and then sang it again. She has a lovely voice and um, as you know she's been a member of the Naples based band called the Prickers mm -hmm. for quite a few years now. They it, just had a reunion. I concert. know, it was great. <laughs> I wasn't there. Sorry to say. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed it immensely at the distillery. Yeah. Um, and my youngest son Ian is grew up playing violin and was very well trained on violin and he is extremely talented on any stringed instrument that you hand him. Mm -hmm. So he plays banjo, violin, guitar and his most useful thing is a mandolin. And a lot of people don't know a mandolin is the exact same tuning as a violin. No, I didn't know that. So if you know where the notes are on a violin, you know mm -hmm. where they are on a mandolin. And he's in he lives in Richmond, Virginia, which is a good spot because mandolin, there's a lot of bluegrass, bluegrass down there. Yeah. And he actually plays in three or four different bands, uh, real gigs. Right. Uh, they do shows and he's uh, been on a PBS sponsored, um, there's, there's a, it was filmed at a PBS related studio. There's a series called Red Barn Radio mm -hmm. that he is playing mandolin and doing all the backup singing for a band called Woody and the Piners which is a fairly popular band down in that region. They travel to multiple states and play out. Interesting. 
Yeah, and it's a it's a YouTube video that you can watch an hour and forty seven minutes of that band playing. <laughs> <laughs> we watched it all live. I'll look it up. Um, next, about your photography, can you speak a little about it? How you got involved? Well, I know your parents were photographers. They were, and we always, when I was a kid, we always had a dark room in the house, mm -hmm. which I started messing around with in like third grade. Um, in fact, in third grade, my father even came to my school and gave the entire class a quick lesson in darkroom photography. Wow. Um, and the, we, there was a big janitor's closet that they had set mm -hmm. up this stuff in. And we used to have little periods after that where two or three of us could go in that mm -hmm. and print some pictures if we had negatives and that type of thing. Um, so we always had a dark room at home. They always took pictures. I didn't do much with that until we were in Brockport when mm -hmm. I created a dark room and started doing a huge amount of black and white photography to the point of I was buying film in bulk. You get like 100 meters of film on a spool wow. in a can that you didn't want to open unless you were in a completely pitch black room and I would, right. you would put that in a film winder and then you would take cassettes that you could open up, 35 millimeter cassettes, mm -hmm. this is 35 millimeter black and white film, and just wind, if you wanted a 10 shot roll, you just wind up a 10 shot roll. I never heard of that. That was, well, it's old school now. <laughs> <laughs> no one's heard of it. <laughs> Do they still sell that film? I, well, in bulk, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. You can still buy some types of black and white film. Sure, there's still some people doing film photography. Um, so I always had a dark room mm -hmm. and moved it from uh, Brockport to Livonia to Rushville, kept rebuilding new dark rooms. Mm -hmm. This is all very pre-digital. Right. Um, when I was in Brockport, I, I'll give you a couple examples. I did a lot of pictures that I would put in the campus newspaper just for fun, yeah. and I took all the uh, my nursing class had about 60 students. Everybody needed a picture for their license. I did all, everybody's picture. Um, and I also provided pictures for... A, I had a friend who was the editor of the Albion Advertiser, which was a weekly, mm -hmm. but they had a lot of articles in it as well. And I developed all of them and printed all their pictures for him to use. And I actually, that company actually paid me like five dollars a picture <laughs> to do that. He would come over and hand me some film. Yeah. Um, so I had a dark room in Livonia and Brockport. I even uh, my daughter in not Brockport in Rushville. My mm -hmm. daughter in Rushville was in a Bluebirds mm -hmm. group, which was like the young 4-H, and I did a whole class with the, her group, teaching them darkroom skills and gave them all little challenges of things they had to take pictures of in right. the backyard. And had like four kids at a time in the darkroom doing their pictures. It was a lot of fun. I always wanted to do that, but never had the opportunity. Darkroom? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a totally different kind of... Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and you can edit, sort of edit the stuff. I mean, you can fool around with the... Well, you can control the contrast and the right, brightness, right. and there's different grades of paper, like there's high contrast paper and low contrast, and it is possible in a dark room, it's called dodging and burning. If someone's face needs to be darkened a little bit, mm -hmm. you can take a piece of cardboard with a little hole in it and hold it. Everything is held between the enlarger and the paper that you're printing on. Okay. So if you, if you don't want light to hit something, you dodge, you have something on a little stick. Right. I've it, seen it done. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fascinating to me. Yeah, and then you make a lot of mistakes. Yeah. You throw a lot of paper away doing <laughs> It's not like editing on your digital camera. No, no. <laughs> on, yeah, on the computer, Yeah. which is so easy. Or even in the camera itself. 
I do. I did uh, flip over to digital in 2002, and I did that when I realized that the I was walking. When I was at the photo department in Walmart, mm -hmm. the old Walmart. It yeah. dawned on me. I realized that the if you brought in a digital file, and this is pretty early in digital cameras, they were using the same printer, printing machine, not made by Kodak, mm -hmm. it was made by the, uh, the big, is it Fuji maybe? Yeah. They were using the same machine to print those pictures as they were if you handed them negatives. And then I'm like, okay, time, mm -hmm. to, time to switch over then. Yeah. Uh, not thinking about printing my own stuff. You didn't have any qualms about it. You weren't a purist. Uh... Well, the more I read, and now I know that digital is far superior to mm -hmm. film in many, many ways. Is there anything about film that you prefer? In my opinion, some people would argue with me on this. In my opinion, no, not at all. There's so many advantages to mm -hmm. digital. You, if you want to, digital has a much higher resolution. It has a much higher color gamut, it's called, G-A-M-U-T, which is the range of different tones. But you can also limit it down to film if, you, if you're so inclined. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's, yeah. there's something like called white balance on film, which is endlessly adjustable mm -hmm. digitally. You can make something look warmer or, or colder, which is, means more blue. I've just started editing stuff uh, on the on the camera, and they have all these, uh, the white balance, the black balance, all the rest of it. Are you I talking about a phone or on a real camera? On a phone. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> no, I know, I'm that's most people's cameras now. But it's amazing what you can do with the warmth, with the tint, with the, oh, uh, it's the huge. pop, they call it, and the contrast, yes. and all the rest of it. And, and you, if you actually have good software on a real computer, mm -hmm. you can do a whole lot more yes. than that. And I'll give you a, well, one quick example is cloning. If I take a picture of a beautiful sky and there's a telephone pole and a wire going through mm -hmm. it, I can actually clone out the entire wire in the telephone pole. There's somebody who keeps making fun of me when I post pictures of uh, you know, Main Street or something like that, and there's always telephone wires going through it. And mm -hmm. I see I see the lazy photographer is at it again. Get out of your car. <laughs> and I thought, well, there must be a way of uh, editing this. Yeah, it's via computer. Okay. Totally. I'll look into it and make him happy. Actually, for a while I thought of starting a business where people could send me a file and mm -hmm. I would alter it. I even own a, I own a, I own my own website for photography, but I also own a domain. I Keep paying fifteen dollars a year to keep the mm -hmm, domain yeah. called PictureFixes.com. Figured I'd grab it about seven, eight years ago for I, someone I would else. Be your, I would be your best customer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and a lot of people. I think. Um, so I developed uh, developed funny word mm -hmm. a small photography business starting in about two thousand and six or two thousand seven. Focusing on focusing <laughs> on nature, and <laughs> nature and landscape <laughs> photography, and I got frustrated within two years of sending off files mm -hmm. on the internet to see what print you'd get back, or sending them to Walmart, and nothing ever quite matched. So I bought a large format Epson printer, mm -hmm. which changes everything because then I could make 13 by 19 inch prints exactly how I wanted them to be. That's, is that an inkjet or a laser printer? It's not laser, it's ink. Mm -hmm. But it's also Epson photo printers use uh, pigment-based ink, mm -hmm. whereas a lot of other printers, are. if you have a simple, uh, you know, any kind of printer, it's dye, it's not pigment. What's the difference? Well, the difference is pigment-based ink is what they say will last one to two hundred years, whereas dye-based ink is what fades. Okay. And a lot of that's still unknown, but um, real photo printers use a pigment-based ink. So, but is Epson the only one that does that? No, I mean, no, they all do. Everybody does. Canon, mm -hmm. uh, well, all the companies.
these have large printers. They're not cheap. No. You're looking at uh, $500 to $1,000 easily, but I've been using the same $800 printer for more than 10 years now. It's got eight ink cartridges in it. That's They're, a big investment in itself. Well, the ink cartridges are only about $15 a piece. Oh, okay. And I can do one at a time. Mm -hmm. The problem is they're not sold anywhere anymore. I have to get them from Epson.com. So when Epson stops selling those, yeah. I'll have to throw the printer away, basically. I can't even get them on Amazon, believe it or not. That's interesting. Why is that? Why, why aren't they still selling them? Uh, because it's an older printer. They've upgraded okay. several times since then, and they're using a different system now. Mm -hmm. I just really like the print. The, the cool thing about the printer is, if you've printed in a dark room, 13 by 19 is a pretty big piece of paper. Chances are, if you print that size in a dark room, you're going to find there was a speck of dust on the negative in the enlarger, and it's going to be a little white spot. Mm -hmm. I would say out of literally 500 to 1,000 prints I've made on that printer, I have never found a fault on a picture. A little dark mark, a little white speck. That's amazing. It is amazing after using dark <laughs> rooms. You must clean it often or... Well, no. Actually, that self-cleans and takes care of itself. Um, huh. It's, it's not a matter of dust. It's a matter of the ink laying down correctly inside okay. of it. And uh, it's just basically perfect. I hate to have it yeah. not be useful. <laughs> right. I understand. <laughs> and most of the pictures I print are 13 by 19, and I put them in 18 by 24 inch frames. So they're pretty good sized. I didn't know they made 13, 13 by 19. Well, that is... Do you have to cut it yourself? Or? No, that's the largest. No, it's very popular because that is the standard for as the largest okay. size that all large format printers will take. I'm just used to the usual... Sure. You know, Eight and a half by eleven, and eleven by seventeen, or whatever. Yeah, it is. yeah, right. Um, yeah, and if you go into a frame store like Michaels or wherever, mm -hmm. you'll see a ton of eighteen by twenty-four inch frames. Right. That are made to take an a thirteen by nineteen with a mat inside. Okay. So I have sold a lot of pictures at a lot of places. Um, I've actually kept track. Okay, I've kept track and sold. Um, more than a thousand framed pictures. I've never sold pictures that aren't framed. And I've sold them a lot to just friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I sell them once in a while. I'll do a show somewhere. I used to do, for a couple of years, I did the Canandaigua Chris Kindle Market and mm -hmm. Springtime in Canandaigua. And I've decided not to do those anymore. I did well at them. But the process of setting up and sitting there yeah. For three or four days. In the cold. In the cold, especially the Chris Kindle yeah. one, in the mud. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Having rain come off the tent into, yeah. my, into my booth. <laughs> um, so I don't really do that. I'm very happy just having them here and there. And right. I, um, one thing I wanted to touch on, I feel like I'm sitting here tooting my own horn all day, is... Uh, I retired from my nursing career. I worked at Strong for 31 mm -hmm. years, except for in the middle of that, I tried the, three, the VA for three years and did not care for it. Candy with VA, mm -hmm. and I went back to Strong. I didn't feel like the VA was giving very good care to people, and I didn't want to be part of it after a few years. And I got to say, Strong, everyone I worked with at Strong always did the best they could, period which is a great way to work mm -hmm. in a field like that. And uh, I stopped working 10 years ago. Tina retired nine years ago from her. Uh, she was an elementary special ed teacher here in Canandaigua. And we've been having a blast since then, <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah. And I, we both now do a lot of what people would call volunteer work. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of mine is at the Wood Library where I, I'm the treasurer of the Friends of Wood Library and have been for about six years. And I'm very active in that group. Uh, 
I also am in charge of all the art shows at the library. I'm the exhibit curator at the library. Um, so I take care of the art shows there and I also once a week do open tech hours at the library where people can come in with any device at all. It's very valuable. It's fun. Yeah. It's like a, it's our weekly Chinese <laughs> puzzle, I call it. You never know right, what's right. coming in the I door. Know. I've even had a person drag their entire desktop computer. I helped them get it all out of the car. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That was fun. And uh, I've done that for about six years, the, the open tech. Well, they're lucky to have you, and you're lucky to have them, too. Well, and it, well it's a team of us that did it. Um, I have also taught some digital photography there. Mm -hmm. And I'm due to start teaching about Android phones again in April through Office of the Aging, but at the library, and I'll be doing a class in April. I'll have to come to that. So I will say yes, I'm a little proud of my <laughs> volunteer work. You should be. Um, I also am really active with the Rochester Astronomy Club, mm -hmm. and once a month, in fact today I need to finish it, I, I create their newsletter, which is usually a 10 to 12 page Newsletter that I put together. Newsletter, yeah. Um, and well Tina's very active with the Arts Council, which pulls me into it too quite a bit. Right. That's why I have pictures upstairs here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for agreeing to do this. It's been a pleasure sure. for me. I hope you haven't suffered too much. <laughs> no, it's it's kind of flowed. That's been good.